you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney prior to and during questioning. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. You understand your rights? Warning, each episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast, will contain descriptions of acts of violence or of a sexual nature and are for people that are 18 years or older. Heed my warning, people. I do not get the facts of these cases off the internet or from some television show. These facts are I'm retelling were presented to me by the victims of the crime or the perpetrators who committed the crimes. My descriptions of the crime scenes are what I saw with my own two eyes. If you are going to get offended, turn this podcast off now. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. As always, I'm your host, Woody Overton. Today, I'm sitting with... Detective David Rabelais, retired Detective David Rabelais uh, in Texas. And we need to talk about some very important things that did and didn't happen in the investigation. And, of course, Detective Rabelais was the first or the lead investigator on Courtney Coco's homicide. So you want me to call you David or? Call me whatever you want, as long as you call me for supper. <laughs> or don't call you late for dinner, right? Yeah. So, um, so David, if you can, tell me how you got involved or what, what will you get the call or just walk me through it. Hey, uh, I I was the detective here in, in Winnie. This was my, uh, my part of the county to investigate. And one morning, uh, I was in my office early. And we got a call from dispatch that said that there's a possible body uh, on 1406 uh, in in the abandoned house. They gave me the address, but I knew what they, where they were talking about. Uh, me and the guy that was working patrol that day went over there, and uh, sure enough, there was a uh, deceased body. It was of a white female. Uh, she was unclothed from the waist down. Uh, posed with her legs open as if she had been raped or, or something. Uh, at that time, my supervisor, uh, Mike Wheat, uh, had come down, and we were looking at the body, uh, and I noticed a ring on her uh, right hand ring finger, and it was a uh, high school ring. Of course, the body was so swollen, it, was, it had been deteriorating, and uh, but it was so swollen we couldn't get the ring off, so we had to cut it off. Once we cut it off, it gave us a name. It was A name was carved inside the ring, Courtney Coco, and of course, on top of that, Alexandria uh, you know, High School. That's how, that's how we knew where she came from and who she was. Uh, so right then, my the patrolman and uh, Captain Wheat <coughs> were walking around uh, picking up evidence. There was a few beer bottles. There was a, a, a wash rag uh, that was actually outside the building in the grass and just some other things uh, laying around. We picked up everything, see if we can get fingerprints or DNA or anything off of it. Um, while they were doing that, I called Alexandria PD, and I told them who I was. I told them what I had, and they said that they would have to get me in touch with an investigator. And I said, well, that's fine. I said, uh, you know, tell him I'm, I'm waiting. I'm waiting on a call. And about 15, 20 minutes later, a Detective Green called me back. And I told him, we have a body over here uh, from your jurisdiction. Th- uh, this is her name. Uh, do you know her? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know her real good. He said, she's just no crackhead, no dopehead. And I said, well, that's, you know, that's not 
that's not important right now. Right now, it's important that I have her body over here, deceased. It looks like it's been deceased for three or four days. The way the way the body, you know, is, is starting a decomposition. <clears throat> and uh, so that was the end of me and Detective Green's uh, conversation. Then, once we got the body picked up, we got the crime scene all done. We got the evidence all tagged and bagged and and put up. I went back to my office, and that's when I started uh, making phone calls again to Detective Green. But let me ask you this: when, when your initial contact with Green, um, and he said, "Yeah, we know her," et cetera. The, um, did you, at what point did you ask for the search warrant? Uh, <clears throat> actually, I'm, I'm sorry, I uh, went ahead of myself there. When I was on the phone with Green, the, the original time when I told him we had the body over there, I asked him. I said, "Can you secure a search warrant?" And and run it on on her house, see if we can get any any evidence or any clues or anything you know off, out of the house. Uh, I don't know if she was murdered in her house. I don't know if she was murdered down the street. I don't know if she was murdered right here in Winnie. I didn't know, but uh, you don't want to leave you don't want to leave any loose ends open. I mean that's a good place to start. And uh, he said he would. He said he would secure the search warrant and he would let me know what they got. Well, it was. T- if I remember correctly, bear with me. It's been 15 years. Take, it, it's, it's take been, your time. <clears throat> about three or four days later, uh, I contacted Green again. I asked him, I said, did y'all get a chance to run the search warrant? He said, yes, we did, but we didn't get nothing. He said the comforter was missing off of her bed. And uh, there was an article of clothing, if I'm not mistaken, it was a pair of blue jeans or something that was by the bed on the floor. And he said, that's that's all that we saw that was out of place or you know, there wasn't anything else. So he didn't tell you that he took numerous items from the residence. No, I and, found that out much later. And you went, when I came to over here to Winnie three weeks ago or whenever it was, and uh, you told me that, then I showed you the, the stuff that was taken off the search warrant, which was like, it was numerous Dr. Pepper cans, beer cans, cigarette butts, domino games, it's just a cigarette pack, all this different stuff. He didn't tell you that they seized any of that. No, sir. Not at all. Okay. And don't you think that would have been important? That would have been a very important piece of information. Uh, cigarette butts is an excellent way to run DNA uh, because it's got a lot of saliva in it. Uh, the Dr. Pepper cans, the beer bottles, all that could have been fingerprinted. The dominoes could have been fingerprinted. Right. Uh, I mean, there was just so many opportunities to to further the case right there on on on, on all that evidence that they that they got. Right. If he would have told me they had it, I would have gladly drove up there and got it, signed for it, and took it to the uh, Texas State Police Lab and let let them do do the DNA and the fingerprints. Right, and as you know, when you do a search warrant and um, you, you seize items from the house, at least in the state of Louisiana, we have to do a search warrant return where you list the items that were taken, et cetera, and establishes the chain of custody and validates your search warrant, right? Also here in Texas, we do the same thing. Okay. So the he just straight up told you they didn't get anything. Correct. They told me that the comfort was missing off the bed and there was a pair of, a pair of blue jeans on the floor by the bed. He didn't even say if they took the blue jeans. Right. He okay. just said that they were there. And, and but and he he said there was nothing to test or right. He said there was you know that's all they got is what he said. He uh he just said look there was nothing in there, the comforter was missing off the bed so and there was a pair of blue jeans by the bed and he said that's that's about it that's all that seemed out of place, or you know that that interested us and and but it, and they didn't get anything they didn't get anything I mean like you said and if it was my case I'd have been made a beeline to, to get that. In it evidence oh, as quickly as most possible, definitely right? <clears throat> most definitely and, uh, uh, so I, I don't understand that i mean i just it, it blows my mind um uh, as an investigator and i just i mean it blows my mind and blew my case right yeah that's right if it's, i would have had that evidence 15 years ago this case could have been might have been solved right then right and especially when you know it's because it would right? tell you who was there who was there with her in her last her last minutes right. who was there right right and okay and you had all that evidence and it, you hid it from me you kept it from me and and it's going to be really interesting to see um if it's still in evidence or not right yeah i would be surprised so the 
Okay, so he doesn't tell you about that. And um, did you go to the autopsy? No, I did not. Okay. The, but it was conducted in Beaumont. Yes, right. Jefferson and then, County I mean, Moore. Right. And I have the, the autopsy report, um, the full report, et cetera. And they did the toxicology on her. And can you tell me what tell me what you learned about the autopsy? Uh, the toxicology report is what I was interested in because uh, there was no no obvious cause of death on the body. There was no stab wounds. There was no bullet wounds. There was no ligature marks around the neck. There was no uh, no signs of of anything. So I thought for sure it had to be in, in the toxicology. Got to t- and uh, I had earlier talked had gone to Alexandria <clears throat> and talked to a person of interest. Um, and she told me that her and Courtney had left the domino game and left Courtney's house and went down the street to, uh, I can't remember. It was either, uh, uh, McDonald's or Sonic where the person of interest boyfriend was working. They had to go pick him up from work, but he, uh, he wasn't ready to get off when they got there. So her and Courtney rode around and smoked a bunch of weed and drank beer. And then she told me that after they picked up the boyfriend, that they smoked some more, rolled some more joints and smoked some more weed and drank some more beer. Right. Well, I get the toxicology report back and there's no marijuana. There's no, there's a very minute trace of alcohol, but as an investigator, you know, that could come from the decomposition of the body. Right. Uh, right. Uh, the it, body. it certainly wasn't enough to cause a death. Right. If it was ingested, but, uh, and, and let me and let me let me interrupt you and say this, and I have not said this yet on the podcast, but it's a very important fact that when I read the autopsy report, there also, and I don't know who sent it, whether it was you or or uh, Texas Rangers or whatever, some somebody got a second opinion, uh, and and I'll have it, and I'll show it to you later. It, it, it's a letter from a different lab stating that that amount of alcohol that she had in her system could not have killed her because her lungs weighed out at a normal weight. Evident right. when you when you if you die of an alcohol overdose, you, your lungs are yeah, heavy. Real heavy. The pockets in your lungs hold the alcohol. Right. And so her her lungs were weighed by a forensic pathologist who actually had custody of the body. Let's talk about that. Let me back up. The when you work in the scene um, and you process it, you process it for the evidence and everything else. And I mean, the, the t- tell me about or tell, let's tell the listeners about uh, how you secure the body and, uh, and maintain the chain. What, when you secure the body, it becomes your piece of evidence. How do right. you maintain a chain of custody? Can you right. tell me about that? <clears throat> yeah. Here in Texas is what we do is when we have a body, uh, the lead detective, the first officer on the scene, uh, we usually stay with the body until what we, we do, we call a body car uh, to come pick up the body and transport it to the morgue. Well, once they pick it up. Uh, but when and, they when they pick it up, they they, they bag it and, and yeah, lock it? Or? They usually bag it and strap it down on, on a gurney. Right. But, but in, uh, in, in Louisiana, when we do it, the bag, the bag has like a, um, like a, a lock thing with a number on it. And it's not a metal lock. Each bag has its individual one. So once it's sealed, then it, you take a photograph of that. And when you go, the, when it gets time for the autopsy, you have to match it, make sure it's the right one that it hasn't been tampered with, et cetera. And they, and they right. cut it open to maintain the chain of custody. Of course, that's <clears> to <throat> stop defense attorneys from saying that something was planted afterwards or whatever. Right. So, and you also, uh, we, I did not, uh, for some reason, I did not go to that autopsy. I usually do. Uh, I think Captain Wheat went to it uh, because I couldn't make it. Um, also, when they, as you said, as they unlock the bag, they unzip it, they open it, they'll ask, is this your victim? Right. Yes, it is. Okay. Uh, and then you take pictures as well as the pathologists take pictures. Right. and um, maintaining that and, and maintaining it know, in that way yeah. after after the autopsy is done the morgue would usually call the family to make arrangements to have the body picked up and taken to whatever funeral home they want right. in this case being out of state uh, you know they had to uh, 
I'm sure they sent an ambulance or someone from Louisiana to come down here and pick up the body and take it to the to the funeral home. Right, but after the autopsy is complete, then I mean it's it's released basically as a, as a piece of the evidence, right? So they, could they, they have a burial, etc. Uh, um, and you don't want to hold it too long, like any piece of evidence. You don't want to hold it too long because it can be. Something like that can't be sealed in an evidence bag, really right. sealed to where yeah, it can't right. be tampered with. Well, they during the autopsy, they take, they'll <clears throat> you know, take samples of everything and weigh all the different organs. And we know, and I don't know who did it, but I'm thank God for it every day that uh, the independent lab thing wrote this letter stating that this alcohol level did not kill her because her lungs didn't weigh enough. Period. And, right. and so, and and we'll get to that. The reason that that's important in a little while. It takes a lot of alcohol to kill you. Uh, uh, I mean, it, I mean, it, it takes more than just a minute. Right. It, it, the I mean, I I tell this story back when I was in uniform patrol on one of my nights off. I wanted to see, you know, uh, about if I drank so much, I wanted to go into the police department and blow on the on the intoxilizer, and I did. And I mean, I uh, I did. I set it out with a purpose to drink as much as I could in like two hours of beers. Mm-hmm. And I think I drank like 13 beers and I was hammered and I went in and I blew and I only blew 0.14 and I'm talking about, and I'm a big guy and I was a lot bigger then, but Courtney was only 110 pounds. Yeah. And, it, and, and, but anyway, it doesn't matter at this, this autopsy, the person who actually had eyes on Courtney's body performed the autopsy. Uh, they did the drug screen and everything. It sent off and, and, came back no marijuana in her system and a minute amount of alcohol yeah no narcotics at all uh, if i remember correct there was no narcotics right. in her system at all nothing and, no and marijuana no no nothing meth or anything which also goes against green saying is she's a crackhead or or, or whatever right yeah so the- i would think if i was a if i was a crackhead and i was smoking marijuana that i would also smoke some crack i mean you know you're not just going to smoke marijuana if you're a crackhead right. because that crack is so addicting right you got to have it right Right. And then, um, okay, so autopsy is done. Uh, let's talk about when, when you went to Alexandria and you talked to the person of interest and she she told you they smoked all this weed. Uh, when you and I talked the, f- the first time, if I'm not mistaken, you told me you almost like baited her. And you were like, okay, just a little bit of weed or a lot of weed. And you, she, she, you said she was pretty adamant that, no, we smoked a bunch of weed. Yeah. Right. Correct. And I, I, I put all that in a written statement. Uh, I took a written statement from her. Of course, I was writing it as she was dictating it. Uh, that's the way we do it Do it here for clarity reasons. Just at the bottom of your statement, we always put that this statement was written as it was dictated by so-and-so. Right, right. and you have them and sign it. have them sign it, and it's notarized. And was this, this done in the presence of Detective Cedric Green? No, it was not. Uh, Cedric Green picked up or contacted this person of interest, had her meet us at the station, and then me and her went into a uh, just a little separate room by ourselves okay. for the interviewer. So when you – the first time you go to Alexandria uh, PD and you meet with them or whatever, um, what, how did it progress? And, and what, what did you <clears throat> feel or not feel or – Well, the first time I went uh, – First, I met with the family, and then I went. To, I called Cedric Green and told him I was coming up to the PD, uh, so we could put our heads together with what we had already. And uh, I showed him the statement that I took from this person of interest, and I told him that there was, uh, according to her, that there was another person of interest who was supposed to be at that time Courtney's boyfriend. Mm-hmm. Um, so I asked Detective Green if he could locate the boyfriend and let me interview him. Uh, well, we went and got in his car. Uh, we rode around some of the bad neighborhoods of Alexandria. And he just kept pointing, you know, hey, you know, there's a big crack house. There's a big dope house. You know, here's but and I'm thinking to myself, I don't care. Let's, you know, where does this person of interest hang out? Where do you normally find him? Where does he do his business? That's where I want to go. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if we ever went there or not, because I was never told this is where he, you know, he or she hangs out. Let, let me interrupt you real quick, David. <clears throat> I found out um, last week when I was interviewing Courtney's sister when when she got notified and she went to the house. First of all, Green 
just called the mom Stephanie and said your daughter's dead in Texas. Very unprofessional. Yeah, I mean that's that's just such shit. And then the as a I guess you know, they're calling back or whatever happened. He at some point he got he he got up and actually went over to their residence to be in Stephanie's residence, the mom's. And when Courtney's sister shows up later on. The and they're talking about that person of interest you were just talking about the male, and and she says, "Hey, I know, I know where he lives." And he asked Courtney's sister and her boyfriend to go get the address off the house. So he had the address. He knew where the guy lived he before knew. you got there, and <clears throat> but he had never told you that, or he never took you to his house, or never. Or he took me by several houses, but he never said this is where he lives or this is where he hangs out. He was just showing me dope houses, yeah, three or four of them. And uh, I just finally got to the point where, hey, okay, let's, let's go back to the station and, see and put our heads together and see what we can get. Uh, I asked him, you know, of course, <clears throat> the way I learned it, uh, the first thing you do in a homicide investigation is clear the family. You, you clear the people who's closest to the, to the victim. Right. Friends and family because nine out of ten uh, homicide victims are killed by someone who knows them. So, right, absolutely. Uh, I began to interview the family, the, the mother. Uh, the stepfather, the sister, uh, the grandmother, the aunt, and a couple of friends that had showed up at the house. I kind of uh, interviewed them a little bit, but you know, they were just, you, you could tell right off the bat, they didn't, right. they didn't and, know anything. And, they were just shocked. And I'll say, go ahead and say it, in case somebody hadn't listened to it before, Stephanie, the, Courtney's mom, and her <clears> husband, <throat> Mr. Bobby, who raised Courtney, uh, were actually at a hunting camp with several witnesses uh, then and she pretty much was excluded pretty quickly even though she did submit to uh two voice stress tests at, at green's request now which leads us to the next part green called courtney's sister and say, he told her he said hey look I, I got some new information in courtney's case i need you to come down here right now and she was like okay and she, she says she hung up and she called her mom and said, look, they got information. Are, are y'all going? And she's like, Stephanie said, nobody called me. And but so the sister goes down and Green brings her in the room. There was a polygraph evidently set up. But she said before that happened, I mean, the, he, he just immediately started uh, saying, you, you killed your sister. You did this. You need to confess, et cetera. And she's like, I didn't do shit. And, and the, um, she said it went on for over five hours that beating her up on it. Now you don't do that. That's ridiculous. They, no, that's- you don't do that, but it's not fair to you polygraph examine the person taking the test or you're requesting to take the test to jack them up before you don't no, interrogate them before the polygraph. No, Cause it's not got fair. Them all worked up. You've got right. their blood pressure up. You got their heart rate up. You got that's their right. nerve. They're nervous. They're probably sweating and, and, and thinking, Hey, this guy thinks I killed and, my sister. And she said she, he, she requested a glass of water at some point. He wouldn't even let her have a sip of water. And that when it came time to the actual mm-hmm. polygraph and they, uh, examiner came in and they put the stuff on her. She was like, she, and she has a medical issue, but she she's like, screw this. And she ripped it off and, and, you know, said, I'm not doing this. She said she absolutely felt that, you know, he, he was badgering and he, he just wanted her to confess. Yeah. And, and, he to confess her for and when she was leaving, um, he said, if you don't come back at nine o'clock in the morning, it's going to look like you murdered Courtney. And that's when she left and she called a, a, a family member that was in law enforcement. And he said, you go back there and you take the polygraph test and you answer yes or no and you tell the truth. So this is where. This is something that you didn't know about, and I didn't know about until this past week. I didn't, I didn't know about this the first time I came over here to, to Texas to talk to you, that she went back the next morning, and she went into a room with a polygraph examiner at 9 o'clock, and this guy is legitimate. He uh, I know him through my career as a polygraph because I'm a polygraph examiner also, and sometimes he even refers clients to me now that, I, that I'm retired from law enforcement. So, but... He, she said he treated treated her like totally professional and like you're supposed to and and explained the, the the process and they made up the questions and she took the he ran all the charts and everything and as soon as he got done he said there he said her name and he said there is absolutely no doubt in my mind you had nothing to do with Courtney's 
death. You pass this polygraph test. Now, what does that differ from what Green told you? Green told me that they polygraphed uh, the sister, or they tried to. They said they he didn't tell me anything about the five-hour uh, interrogation before, none of that. He just told me that they uh, got her into the polygraph room, they hooked her up to the machine, and she freaked out, ripped everything off, said she's not doing it, and ran out. Right. He did not tell me she came back the next morning. Uh, he did not tell me she took a polygraph and, and successfully completed it. Uh, but he did tell me that they, uh, that they after she ripped the, the stuff off, said she wasn't doing it, they got her down to another room and did a voice stress uh, analyzer test. And he told me she failed that. And I'd never heard of that before. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time, it was, I guess, fairly new. And I asked him, you know, what is that? Well, the examiner said, well, it's something new. It's better than the polygraph, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she failed it. And I said, okay. I said, I need to get a copy of your results to put in my case file. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll get it to you. Well, the next day I, I came back to Texas and uh, I gave it a day or two. Then I called them back and I said, hey, I need a copy. Can y'all fax it to me or mail it to me? a copy of that uh, voice stress uh, analyzer test, and uh, I, I never got it. Never uh -huh. got it. Still to this day, I mean, I've been retired five and a half years, but still to this day, 15, day, 15 years later, right. never received it. Right. And so, and I'm going to tell you what the sister said. She took the, the polygraph that morning, and as you know, a real polygraph test is an hour and a half to three hours at a minimum right. just to do it correctly because you have to calm the person and set the psychological set and get the questions clearly defined, et cetera, explain how the instrument works, et cetera. And it's a, it's a tough process, even if you're innocent, right? right? And But what actually happened is when she passed it with the legitimate polygraph examiner, yeah, Green came and got her, but he took her to the room with a voice stress test, totally different guy. And then goes aboard her again. And, uh, but she said she took it twice and they said she passed it. it. Never, never told her she failed it. Period. He told me she failed it. Uh, and, and never produced any kind of report or results. Never, uh, even the, the, uh, examiner, the guy that was given the test, he told me she failed it. Yeah. But he was kind of following. Uh, I got the feeling he was following Green's lead because when Green said, well, she took this voice stress test and, uh, and she failed it. I looked up at the examiner. He was standing right there in front of Green's desk, and uh, he was looking at Green. And Green looked at him and said, uh, and then he looked at me and said, she failed it. And then the examiner said, yeah, yes, yeah, she failed it. She failed it bad. And that's when I said, okay, I, I need a copy of that. I need uh -huh. a copy of that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get it to you. We'll get it to uh -huh. you. So, well, and that, that I want to make it clear for the record, the voice stress examiner is not the same as the polygraph examiner that gave the test that I personally know. Uh, and the voice stress test, like they've said, they've done all the studies since then. And even the Department of Defense and all these famous universities have said you have a better chance of flipping a coin and getting it right than using that. But the one thing that it has going forward, like the polygraph, just having one set up in the room a lot of times gets people to be more truthful. Right. But the, guess what? She was being truthful. Not only did she pass the polygraph, which in the Department of Defense study shows in the hands of a well-trained, experienced examiner is up to 98% accurate, okay? And the she passes it. They don't tell you about that. And that's, first of all, that she submitted to it. I mean, right. they, he tells you she rips the stuff off and, and she, leaves and she refused. Right. That part is true. But he didn't tell you is she came back voluntarily, submitted to it, Passed all the questions. Examiner says you have nothing to do with it. He also told, he didn't tell me about the five hour uh, interrogation. Right. right. Uh, before that, right there, that that's. I'm sorry, it's unheard of. It's unprofessional, and you don't do that before a polygraph. I mean, uh, but what's the point of having the polygraph? Yeah, you know, because it, your polygraph, if I'm not mistaken, works off of your nervous system, your yeah, skin right. sweat, and your blood pressure. That's right. Well, if you've been telling this girl for five hours that she killed her sister. Her blood pressure is going to be up. Her skin is going to be sweaty. Right, her nerves right. are going to be, you know, just and refusing uh, or water or yeah, food uh, or anything, anything else. else, right? And, and then uh, and <clears throat> I'd be scared too. Sure, absolutely. The, uh, so he doesn't tell you about the real polygraph, and then he and whoever this guy is, uh, they tell you that she failed. Correct. Well, she, you know, 
They so didn't tell her so, that. Yeah. yeah. So here we have, you know, we're not even half into the investigation as far as I'm concerned, but we have uh, Detective Green telling me they didn't get anything off the search warrant. Uh, I did not realize, because I never got a copy of the search warrant, which I requested, that it took three days to get the search warrant. Uh, yes, the house was taped off, but in three days, unless you have a uh, uniformed patrolman or somebody guarding the house, anybody could go in there and but tamper the, with anything. But the house wasn't even taped off. They didn't tape it off until the day they did the search warrant, which oh, was three okay. days See, later. I didn't know that either. The, the family could verify that So for that you. left every chance in the world for uh, the guilty party or somebody who knows the guilty party to go in the house and tamper with everything that's in there right and the family verifies that by saying when they put the tape up and they went and did the search for warren they didn't take the tape down for 18 days so they know they had to get permission at some point to go in and get some of her items out right uh, um but uh, it's just mind-boggling the um i don't get it i don't understand it the, no, i don't either it's uh I, I don't know like you said it just blows my mind as an investigator uh Every case I've ever investigated with dual jurisdictions, I've always had complete uh, honesty and, and, and help from the other agency. You always work together. You know, your brother's in blue. Right. Whether this body was found in your your jurisdiction or mine, it came from your jurisdiction. You should be just as enthused about solving this case as I am. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the, the big thing, the big thing is going to the family and say, hey, got him. That's it. Got him. He's in prison. That's it. I mean, you know, and now you can have some kind of peace and some kind of closure. And, and, you know, everybody that's a true crime fan or has watched any kind of shows like the first 48 or whatever, they know how crucial these first hours are. The first and, hours and, are. And the. That's just, when everything's fresh. Just unbelievable. They, they don't go in for three days. And then they don't tell you what they took. Um, and he, when you go there and you're looking to talk to the other per person of interest, which is actually the female's person of interest brother. Correct. And, and, and was at the time Courtney's boyfriend and he can't produce him for you. I mean, come on, man. The, I mean, if I know you come into town and you want to talk to somebody, and I've done it, I, I'll send, we'll yeah. call the narcotics guys in and put them on the street undercover. We're going to find your person. See, and, well, we did that. We're a small department. We mm -hmm. did all that ourselves. Uh, I've done uh, narcotics at another agency. Uh, but I knew uh, I knew my turds. I knew right, who they sure. were. Sure. Your frequent flyers is yeah. what I call them, right? If it's a uh, turd and a no turd zone is what we refer to them <laughs> over here. But uh, if I have a burglary, I know which three or four people I need to go to. Absolutely. <clears throat> If I have an assault, I know which two or three old cowboys to go to. Right. Uh, and you can't make me believe. I'm sorry. <clears throat> you just can't make me believe that Green didn't know where this guy was. Absolutely. But we, or where we, he hangs out, at least. We know that he did because the sister gave him the address. Right. And, 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 uh, did anybody go to the house, knock on the door, and, and bring him in and question him? Who not knows? As far as I That's know. what I'm saying. Not who as knows? Far as I well, know. he didn't tell you they did. No, he didn't. Right? Nope. So, uh, <clears throat> tell me, go ahead. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, at some point, you told me when we talked before that you felt like you were being lied to and, and given the runaround or whatever. Tell me about that and what, what you ended up doing with the chief or whatever. Okay, uh, uh, that is correct. I, uh, at, at one point, I just I knew that I was being just jerked around. Uh, I thought no nobody or no police officer who made it to detective can be this this illiterate into right. this dumb. This is, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's that's you're right. For uh, lack of a better word. Uh, but, but let, let me say this real quick. The and it's important, y'all, that you understand that to to make detective, you got to have some stuff, right? I mean, because when you're a detective, you got to have a little bit. Of, you got to have some street smarts and some street experience, and, and you got to know. And, and and your higher ups have to have trust in you because when ultimately. You're a detective. You're going to be working. Now, look, not everybody is cut out to be a detective. There, there are people that do their, their entire careers in uniform patrol, and they're great at it, right? But I always aspired to be a detective. I wanted to be. And I knew when I got there, I learned everything that I could, and I got there for a reason. It wasn't because of um, 
my brother in law I was related to the sheriff or anything like that. I mean, I wasn't even from that parish, but I got there by making cases constantly and consistently in great cases. And, and so, no, Green doesn't make detective by being a dumbass. No. And it, it, I mean, there's no way. No. And I mean, and, and we're talking about Alexandria. We're not talking about New York City where it's it, it, it's so yeah, big. He course. definitely knew who his turds were inside his jur- jurisdiction. Yeah. I mean, you know, he may not have been able to find him in the next 30 minutes, but in the next day or two, I'm sure he's run across him or yeah. got word to him, I need to talk to you or something. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. Um, but at, at that point, like I said, I I kind I kind of figured that I, I was being jerked around, lied to. Uh, so some things that I was being told by the by the PD by Green and and uh, uh, the boisterous analyzer test operator and some other guys that some of the stuff I was being told just didn't make sense. Yeah, you say you know, just it didn't add up. You had the intuition that <clears throat> and I someone thought, yeah. right. And you know, it's like I told you earlier. I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but. There's a difference between a coon ass and a dumb ass, and I'm a coon ass. Right. I was born and raised in Louisiana. Right. And uh, I just, I knew, I said, something's not right. So I told Green I wanted to speak to his chief. And if I'm not mistaken, the chief then was a Mr. Cootie. Right, Cootie, right. <clears throat> so they took me to talk to the chief, and Green and Bates and another officer, I can't remember his name. He was the one who did the voice analy- uh, analyst. Right. And y'all, real quick, Bates is the <clears throat> um, the purported evidence officer or crime scene guy that did, did Courtney's uh, search warrant. Also, I don't even know if you knew right. that, David. But Well, they all uh, they all went in the chief's office with me, which I kind of felt uncomfortable there because I was I felt like I was being ganged up on. Right. Uh, I need to talk to, to your chief about your actions. I really don't want you in the room. Right. Well, they stayed, and I talked to the chief, and I told him, look, you know, this is a, a, a multi-jurisdictional case. I'm doing everything I do, but I cannot work a case in Louisiana from Texas all the time. I, I, I can't. Right. I've got to have y'all's boots on the ground. I've got to have y'all's ears in the air. You know, y'all have to help me out. And, and I just don't feel like these guys are helping me out. I said, I've been lied to a time or two. Uh, I said, I, I think I'm having evidence withheld from me. Uh, and, you know, I've just been jerked around and I don't appreciate it. I said, this is my second time. To make a trip that my department has paid for meals and motel room and fuel and everything else for me to come up here and try to get this solved so the family can have some closure. And that's all I'm getting is jerked around. Well, the chief then looked at Green, and the way he looked at him was, listen to me, but do what you want to do. You know, just had that look. He said, y'all need to cooperate with this guy. You know, blah, blah, blah. You need to give him what he wants, work with him. Uh, and then that, that, that was about it. We left the office and nothing changed. You know, the next day, I, I just packed it up, and I, I came back to Texas. I was just wasting my time and everybody else's time being over there. I was not getting any cooperation. Uh, I they was getting lied to. And I they weren't getting, producing the people that you wanted right, to talk to. Right, they weren't producing, with, or I say witnesses, people of interest that, that I thought. Uh, it sure would have been nice at that time to have the DNA off those cigarette butts and Dr. Pepper cans. Mm, right. Or we to, could have rounded up a whole lot of people then. Or, or, that, or, to, or to, to know that they even existed. Do you know what? The supposedly, I mean, not supposedly, they told the family not only did they take the domino game, but they, they they had the cards with the people's names on it. The scorecards. Scorecards with the people's names on it that were there that night. That's crazy. That's just. That's, nobody ever told you about nobody that. Nobody ever told me about that. I mean, that, I that's, that's a big, uh, that's a big whammy right there. That gives you some names. I don't know how many people were there, three, four, five, six, but. That gives you somewhere to start. Yeah. You know, the way I was taught, and I'm, I'm sure you're the same way, I don't care how little or how insignificant or how unimportant or how unbelievable a tip is. If you get a tip, especially in a homicide case, you either prove it or disprove it. That's you right. follow it to the end. You don't just say, ah, that don't mean nothing and throw, and throw it out of your mind. Right. You document it and, and, and you, you start working it. It right. may lead you down a rabbit trail to a dead end, but at least you know okay, that tip didn't pan out. Let's go to the next one. One of these tips are eventually going to pan and, out. And another reason you, you can't exclude anything, because if you do, even if you get the right guy, if you, if you, if you ignore these other tips, the defense attorney is going to tear your ass off. Right. They'll be like, well, well like you had this before. lead. You had this lead. Well, you had tunnel vision, right. uh, David Ravel. You had tunnel vision. You, you weren't worried about anybody but my client. Right. So. No, um, and boy, I tell you what, those defense attorneys love to make you look like a dumbass on that stand. Yeah, yeah, that's what they—that's what they get that's paid what for. That's what their mission is. You're right. So the 
I mean, you, you <clears throat> go to Coochie, the chief, and at least you had balls enough to, to just lay it out while they're still in the room, right? I guess you pissed off at this point. You were oh, like, yeah, I was very, yeah. And because the family kept contacting me, and I'm like, I don't have anything to tell you. I'm sorry. Right. I mean, I don't have anything. I'm not. Uh, I'm not getting anything. At first, I kind of withheld it from the family. That stuff was being withheld from me. But it, right. uh, eventually, I just started telling them. They're lying to me. They're jerking me around. They're not producing evidence that I'm asking for. I'm not getting any cooperation. If I'm not mistaken, Miss Stephanie at that point told me that she knew Chief Cootie personally, and she was going to talk to him. And whether she did or not, I don't know. But if she did, it didn't do any good. I was never, I was never contacted or anything again. Right. Okay. The <clears throat> a couple things, and I, I'm trying to get my brain in order on them. There was a news article from December of 2005 that Jim found, and it was from a station up in Alexandria, and they got evidently Stephanie or somebody complained, and they went to APD, put the camera in the face, and said, "Hey, Jack, it, what's up with this? I mean, it's a, it's been 14 months." And y'all haven't done anything, et cetera. And, and they actually told the news reporter, we didn't know we were supposed to be working on this case. And, huh. and then they evidently called your sheriff. Uh, um, and he said, and it was a quote by him. He said, Alexandria PD contacted me. They told me they're sending a couple officers down here so we can get this case back on track. Do you know if that ever happened? I don't have a clue. But, it, you know, I mean, you were still – I mean, you were still here. And- I was still over here, and I was still, I was still following leads over here. Uh, <clears throat> at the time when she was found over here was during the the rice festival, which is a huge, huge festival we have over here uh, once a year. Uh, I was given tips by people here in Winnie that uh, oh, we saw her with so and so, we saw her with so and so, you know, at the rice festival, and they left together. And I, uh, I took these people. There's been, there was two brothers. And then there was two other people, and I, I can't remember. There may have been a fifth. But anyway, I took them to Houston to the DPS State Police uh, headquarters and had them polygraphed. You know, I mean, that was a lead. I was going to follow it out. Right. Well, they, they all passed a polygraph with flying colors, no problem. Yeah, and, and let me ask you about that real quick. Just like when, since we started running the podcast <clears throat> and the tip line, you're going to get, like, I'm sure she was on the local news. As a matter of fact, I know she was because I've seen the articles, et cetera. So people are seeing her in a face or whatever and say, oh, I saw her at, at the Rice Festival or, you know, whatever. Sometimes uh, people just interject themselves or they were trying to get somebody else in trouble correct. or whatever. But you, just you never know, but you got to follow it. Sure. So you you followed all those leads and it, it just didn't pan out. Didn't pan out. Ran into a dead trail. But at least I followed them. That's right. And and But to don't you think, if Alexandra PD ever sent officers down here, they would have wanted to contact the uh, the detective that worked the case. I would think so. I mean, but, but to the best of your knowledge, they never showed. Never showed. They, okay. Nobody ever came down from Alexandria that, that I'm aware of. Well, I mean, if, if, if Cedric Green had come down, you'd have known it. Right. You know, or this other guy, whatever his name is. Um, and they're not that big. They don't well, have Winnie, that big. Winnie Stoll area is only about uh, 2,900 population. It's a farming community. There's more land and cows and rice fields than there is people. Uh, if two detectives or one detective from another state would have showed up, eventually I would have heard about it. Yeah, well, they said that, that the sheriff said that they were coming to the Chambers County Sheriff's Office and they were going to get work hand in hand with Chambers County to get it back on track. It's, not as far as I'm, I yeah. know. Well, exactly. That's I not mean, a shocker. The, yeah. the the sheriff's office main office is in An- Anawak, about 19 miles from here, where I, my office was is a uh, substation. But if they would have gone to Anawak to the sheriff's department, the sheriff the sheriffs are aware of everything that's going on. We only have five detectives. I mean, it's like I said, we're a small right. department. Right. Uh, the sheriff would have sent him to me, or the sheriff would have called me and said, "Hey, come get them. They're they're here waiting on you." Right. I would have known right. about it. Right. Exactly. So and goes, if they came to my office, I would have known about it because it's yeah. there's three offices in that building: the tax office and the commissioner's office and my office. Right. <clears throat> if they would have went to any one of the other two and the JP's office, if they would have went to any of the other three, they'd have sent them across the hall to my office. Right. Right. Or when they walked by, I would have seen men with guns on and stuff, and thought, "Okay, well, who's this? Let me go find out." You know something else I want to verify, and it's kind of skipping around, but the family turned in with 
had had a meeting with Green at some point, and uh, they gave Courtney's cell phone over and full access to it, the numbers and everything in it. In fact, Stephanie had recorded all the numbers before she gave it in, all her contacts and everything. They had all the phone records. I know because I have copies of it. And but when they were handed it in, they asked Green. It, it said, "Look, it, we know that Courtney talked to." Uh, whoever it was, her sister, or whoever it was or before midnight. And that's the last time the phone was used until four something in the morning. And they said, and they wrote it down notes. This family has taken meticulous notes of everybody they've ever talked to times, dates, etc. And they wrote it down and said, green said that was the person of interest. He called the girl's name. That was her. And she was dialing wrong numbers. There's nothing to that. That was her. She was dialing wrong numbers at four o'clock in the morning. Now there were four phone calls, uh, three of them, which did that show on the, on the, on the phone log as one minute. As you know, that's you get somebody's voicemail. They're going to charge you for that one minute, but there's one person she talked to for three minutes. And did they ever tell you about that? I was never told about that. Never told about that. And they, that would have been there again, just like it, the, the evidence in the DNA. That would have been a, that would have been a heck, with, a with, heck of a trail to start following. I tell you, it, it, especially. I'm, I'm you have said it. You need to take a minute. No, all right. It's, it's all right, brother. It just eats. It just eats me up. It eats my lunch. I'm sorry. It's all right. I mean, I, I mean, you're a human being, man. You care about it. And yeah, I was never told about the phone calls. Uh, whether she dialed wrong numbers or not. I'm going to find out whose numbers those are, and I'm going to go talk to them. Well, not only that, why does she have does she her phone number? Four? Why does she have her phone? Yeah. Why Why does she dial four numbers at 4 o'clock in the morning? I mean, who do you have to call at 4 o'clock in the morning? It, it, it's panic calls. Unless, yeah, unless you've, you're you hiding something or you need to hide something. or. Yeah. Well, I know this is hard for you, man. I know no, this. That's okay. It, it, it's okay. Uh, but it's important, right? And, and, and it's very important. Very important. The, the um, I just want to clarify that on that again. My first thought was like you. I would want, I would have wanted to talk to whoever it was she talked to. Secondly, I want to know why in the hell do you have Courtney's phone when you're not even with her? Okay, and then here's the deal: Green knew that the, the Green knew that you had the autopsy results by this time and that you wanted to talk to this girl again and that you, that she had lied to to Correct. you about uh, what they were doing in hours up to her death. Uh, um, and he knew it, but he never told you. Never told me. I told him, I said, y'all need to get this person of interest in the office and hammer her ass because she lied to me in her statement. <laughs> Said so she told me they rode around and smoked weed, and I said there's no marijuana, no narcotics, no obituaries, no nothing in, in her system whatsoever, except for that just minute amount of alcohol. And uh, I said y'all need to get her in there. I said if you want me to come up there and do it again, I'll do it again. Said, no, 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 we, we 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 can do it. We can do it. I never heard another word about it. Never heard another word about it. I, I don't get it, man. And that's that's something that has just aided me for years too. Is that you know why did she lie? Well, why would you sit there and lie about smoking dope? I mean, that's so stupid. If I knew something about a murder, I'd be lying about covering up the murder, not smoking dope. Right. I mean, everybody knew, you know, that that Courtney did did indulge in in, in uh, you know narcotics once in a while. And they didn't give you so a that's not to uh, you don't need to lie to me about that. Uh, and and but it doesn't matter, you know, like when. When I called Green and told him that we had the body and this is who it was, he says, oh, yeah, I know. I know her. She's an old crackhead. I just thought to myself, you know, maybe so, uh, but she's still somebody's daughter. She's still somebody's sister. She's still somebody's niece, right. grandchild. I mean, right. she's she's still a human being. That's right. Human being, and she's so I mean, loved. we all make mistakes. Everybody's got skeletons in their closet. They've done stuff in their lap that they're not proud right. of. Right, and, and she was so loved and is still so loved. <clears throat> And for the record, I know there's no proof that she ever was a crackhead uh, that, right. that I found out anyway. I'm not saying that she didn't do things uh, that young people do or whatever, but the green never tells you about the phone records that you, the girl that you wanted 
them to go aboard her ass or you would come back to do it yourself. It doesn't tell you about this. No. I, I, mean, I mean, I don't want to speculate, but if if a step outside and look in, I say like, like I'm on a jury and this is a jury trial or something, it just really, if you put up all the stuff, lying about, first of all, delaying three days to get the search warrant, lying about what was taken off the search warrant, lying about the polygraph, lying about the voice stress test, not producing Courtney's boyfriend, who was, who was a person of interest. Um, well, if you would have got... <clears throat> it's just too much, man. If I would have known about the evidence they took out of the house, first of all, the cigarette butts, I'm sure at least you could have gotten at least three to five different DNAs off the cigarette butts. The four phone calls, ping the towers, trace the numbers, do whatever you have to do to find out who owns those numbers right then. And that's four numbers, three to five people with the cigarette butts. Let's just say one person with a Dr. Pepper can, one person with a beer can. Right. There's nine, 10, 11 people right there that could have been talked to and interviewed. Absolutely. And no telling what information you would have got. Absolutely. Because at that point, it was still fresh. And when you start poking around at a fresh homicide and you start getting close. That's right. They start getting nervous and then they start lying. Then they start giving each other up a little bit. That's oh, right. Well, I don't know. I saw yeah. her this time, but so-and-so saw her a little later than that. That's um, right. But, but because, you know why? Because of the, the the threat the of jail, on. the threat of jail is real. Then. The pressure's on because it's fresh in their mind. Mm-hmm. And, and 15 years later, they're probably, they've lied and done so much more that you'll never get the truth out of them. Right. Uh, the, uh. The totality of the circumstances of what, how they just absolutely blocked you in every way. It's just out. It's astounding. It floored me. It still floors me to this day. And but you didn't know about most of it until a couple of weeks ago when I came over. Correct. About I mean, three weeks ago when you came over is the first time I ever heard about the phone calls, the evidence seized on the search warrant. Uh. The house not being secured the for three days. The house not being secured for three days. It's taken them three days to, to do the search warrant. The, the I had. assume they did it that day, and he just he was so busy with the case file that I didn't hear from him for two or three days. Mm-hmm. I, I did not realize they didn't run the search warrant for three days. Right. I mean, that's just crazy. Right. You, there was no sense in doing it. You might as well tore it up through exactly. the garbage. Exactly. And then the, the line about the polygraph and the voice stress and, and everything. Um, so... I just I don't understand, and, and people do please understand me. I'm by no means whatsoever bashing police officers. I was one for 27 years. I survived three heart attacks in that 27 years from the stress and the pressure and everything from the job mostly, but uh, 99.9% of police officers are genuine people who really care. They do a job to try to help people for not enough money to feed their family. Exactly. And to me, that, that just means a lot. And it's a brotherhood. It's a brotherhood in blue. Uh, you know, there was, there's an old saying in, in law enforcement, Woody, I'm sure you've heard it before. Either we take an ass whooping together or we give an ass whooping together. But That's you right. do it together. That's right. You're together on everything. You help each other no matter what state you're in, what department you work for. Right. Uh, and, and, that, and that's what just floors me. To, to be lied to and, 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 and omission of, of, of evidence is just... I'm still sitting here thinking my mind's just going in circles and I'm getting a headache just thinking about it. Yeah. It's crazy. And, and nobody is that incompetent. No. Okay. So to me. If he's uh, that incompetent, he should have never been a uniform officer, uh, much less a detective. Exactly. He so, shouldn't have been a crossing guard. Well, I mean, I don't want to speculate, but I hear the, the like I said, if, if this was a jury trial and you're looking in and Cedric Green's actions or lack of actions or lying by omission, et cetera. I mean, it doesn't look, it doesn't, doesn't look, look like enough. negligence, does no. it? It's not, oh, I, I made a mistake. Yeah, I made a boo boo. It was on purpose. It, it was purposely done. Yeah. Well, There's too many things done for it to be a, <clears throat> oops, I, I'm sorry, I forgot about that. There was just too many things, too many lies told, too many uh, uh, omissions of, of, of information. There was just too many of them to, yeah. to say, oops. Yeah. And, and Dave, I want, I want to touch on something, and I know it's going to be tough for you, but it's important. It's really important because of what, what we're going to do, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But when I came over here the first time, y'all, and uh, 
Detective Rabelais, and I met, and he told me about it, et cetera. And, and the, at the end, he said, Woody, this is, he said, I've worked every kind of bad case you can imagine from dead babies to, uh, and I, I, he told me that what somebody had shot themselves, whatever, you know, you're over the, bending over the body and the brains are dripping down to the back of your neck and that kind of stuff. And, uh, uh, he said, I've seen it all. And, but he told me, he said, this is the one case that I ever had nightmares about. And um, then I come and I tell him, and I didn't know everything that he knows now. And uh, I wanted to reach out to him again. I didn't want to, to ask you to go on to, to record that first time. Cause I, I could tell it was you were hurting about it. And then that you were mad about what I had told you. And I was just like, okay, can I, can I just quote you on whatever? I mean, I wasn't going to ask you to, but then a couple of weeks later, uh, last week, as a matter of fact, the, I get, I get a text and it's late in the evening and I'm in an Alexandria in the woods, uh, in my little spot. And I get a text and I wasn't, I, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the number cause I hadn't programmed your number in. And it says, Hey brother, are you up? And I said, yes. And, and he said, I said, who is this? And he said, it's Detective Rabelais. And I, so I called him and. I guess just like for the family, even though the hurt's never gone away after all the years, I guess bringing it fresh and current is basically ripping off scabs for everybody. Um, but I mean, can you tell me what's been going on with you? But and, and just, this, uh, this doesn't make you weak, man. It, I mean, it's just, yeah, you're, I'm, you're so, human, I'm sorry. You're, you're a human being. Um, I'm sorry, but every time I close my eyes, I see that body. Courtney's body. Courtney's body. I see that face decomped. I see the way she's posed to embarrass her, embarrass the family. And it just it brings it all back. It's like I just started working this case yesterday. And uh, it's it's just hard to deal with. It's, it eats me up inside that I can't go to the family and say, hey, guess what? I, I, I did it. Or we did it. We did it. We got him in jail. He's in jail. Now you can have some peace and some closure about your, your child or your sister or your granddaughter or who, you know, whoever she is. Uh, it just, it eats my lunch. I've got four children. I could not imagine somebody calling me from Louisiana and saying one of my children was dead over there and the case being botched up so much. And 15 years later, it's, I, I, just, I couldn't imagine it. I, I just couldn't imagine it. And, and I can't imagine how that family feels, and I feel so strongly for them, and I feel like I failed. I feel like I failed the family because I didn't solve this case. I tried every way I knew, but uh, you you didn't fail, man. They you were blocked, and and I mean that gives me goosebumps. You, if you had done what you done, we wouldn't be this far where we are today. But you didn't fail anything. You were blocked, and. Uh, Every which way possible. In all my years, I've never heard of anything, anything close to this. I've never experienced anything close to this before in 27 years. And, and you know, physically and mentally, I'm just going to ask you the last couple of weeks. I mean, we talked about it a little bit, but this, what's been going on? I mean, well, it's just. The nightmares are back. They had kind of subsided. I was only having maybe one or two a month instead of, you know, three or four a week. But uh, they're back. They're back two, three times a week. I wake up in a cold sweat in the middle of the night. And the dreams are so real. I don't know if you've ever had a dream that was so real. When you open your eyes, you're looking around for the. Yes. That's what I do. I, I jump out of bed. Yeah. I'm shaking. I'm sweating. And I'm looking for Courtney's body. Like, you know, oh, what, golly. And Jeez. it's just. Uh. My doctor had to, had to prescribe some uh, some medication for depression and for anxiety. Uh, just here in the last three or four weeks, well, it and it's uh, it helps some, but it still doesn't. I don't know. It doesn't get it. It's not going to go away for me until this case is solved. Yeah, or I die, whichever comes first. Right. Well, I, hopefully, it'd be we solve it first, and in so the the nightmares and the um. The anxiety and the depression. I mean, and especially having this this last couple of weeks, and you know, 
you know that you could have done so much more, but but you knew it all these years, but you felt you beat yourself up over. But now anybody you, could have a monkey could have done so much more if they would have had the information that was available. And, and, and now you know that you were cock blocked, and uh, it's heartbreaking, man. I'm sorry. It is. I mean, it's just horrible. It's horrible not to be able to go to someone's mother or grandmother and sister and say it's done. It's right. a done deal. It's it's horrible for you to have to worry about closing your eyes because you're going to have a nightmare again. And and I know what you're talking. I also had to be prescribed medicine for sleep because I'd stay up two or three nights at a time. Yeah, I'm sorry, man. But the, the the I know what you're talking about when the when the nightmare is so real that you wake up and you can't you can't. It's like you can't get the dream out of your head even right. after you woke up. It's so real that it's hurt. Uh, it does. I, and it's a it damn does. shame. Uh, uh, Two o'clock in the morning, you're splashing cold water on your face and walk outside to smoke a cigarette just to just to think, wow, you know, what what happened? What happened? Yeah. And then you lay in bed again to try to go back to sleep, and you, you can't. Right. You know, right. I found myself sweeping and mopping and cleaning house at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning just because I couldn't go back to sleep, and Tr- I'm trying to keep my mind busy. Trying, you're trying to get Courtney out of your mind. Right. And, and that's, you know, to have to – I know going on scenes like that and seeing the, the horrible things that we've seen that the, the I'm, I guess I, I know you have to have somewhat of this ability. Also, I've had the ability on 99.9% of them. I can just block it out. I don't ever think about it unless I drive by that place, or whatever, and it'll pop into my head right. what I saw. Right. Otherwise, I don't, I mean, I don't know what, how I would deal with it, but for you, I had a invest as an investigator. I had an eighty five percent closure rate on my cases. Wow! And that's uh, I don't that's know unheard. people. I don't know if that's uh, if you know the national stats, but that's that's pretty high. That's high. That's damn high. That's that's pretty high, and I was proud of myself for that. And that's I guess that's why this case just eats me up. It just eats me up. This is the only homicide I've never closed. Yeah, and and and, and well, the. Mo- I'm going to ask you this. The uh, and you and I talked about this a little bit already. You have a wealth of knowledge, not only on this case, but in your 27 years, et cetera. Now, Jim Raffman and I are, of course, we're not law enforcement any longer, and we're having to work this under the guise of investigative it's journalists a lot or whatever. To do. And but here's the deal, and I'm a, a, a really, really, we need your help. And it, it, whether it's I can pick you up, or pick up the phone and call you at midnight and say, hey, Dave, what do you think about this? Because my brain never shuts off. And, and that's the OCD. I get I don't it's not I don't wash my hands a thousand times a day or check locks. My, I just can't stop my brain. Right. And then in, in, in this case, somebody put a post on the Facebook page today saying, what do you sound it so tired on the last episode? I said, well, guess what? I was <laughs> I'm sleeping like two hours at a time. And it's the first Stay thing up. I think about when I wake up, and it's the last thing I think about before I go to sleep. Hell, I had, I had been home. I went home the other night. I think I got to stay at my house for 20 hours for the first time in a month, and then I'm back on the road, right? And, but my wife gets it, and she knows that I've already left mentally, like the first time I came over here to see you. Um, but can will you please help us? Oh, no problem. And, 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 and I'm here. And, uh, it's huge, man, because you know, you know that – Two heads are better than one, and three heads are better than better two. two. And I think with what Jim does, and he is, he's just the master digger yeah. and, uh, and and getting all the details, et cetera. And what I do, and then what your total experience all together, it's you know what, dude, it's about it's about getting mm-hmm. it's about solving this. Different man. minds work different ways. That's right. I may be thinking about this That's while you're exactly thinking about right. that, and I'm not thinking about that. And you bring it up, and it's like, oh, you know what, I didn't. But didn't the, consider that. I, didn't but, think I, about that. I don't know that the general public understands that. I mean, you watch TV shows or whatever, and you think it's like this, or whatever. But the I've you don't, well, get, broken, you don't get DNA back in fifteen minutes. Believe me. Yeah, 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 for real. But I, some of the best ideas ever that saw the biggest cases are just by sitting around bullshitting just like this. Right. And, and like you and I were talking, I was telling you some facts. But I used we to started. call it coffee shop information. Yep, there you go. You go get you a cup of coffee in a coffee shop or a donut shop. Yes, the police yes. Do, do go to donut shops. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, <clears throat> but you get you a cup of coffee, you sit there, and you just listen. 
Yeah. Well, if it's in the part of town that your that your crime is in, you know, you got three or four burglaries in this part of town. Well, you find you a little, you know, a waffle house, a, a donut shop, a coffee house in that right. part of town, and you just sit and listen, drink your coffee. Right. right. Somebody in there is going to say something that's going to make you go, hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> and the, and you don't learn that by chance. That comes from experience. Right. Right. So, but but yeah, I'm pumped, dude. Um, to have you, uh, I mean, well, I'll do anything that I can do to I help. Know, I know you will. I, know uh, I don't watch Forty Eight Hours and all that stuff. I don't I either. I lived it for twenty seven years. I don't need to watch it. I, I watched like one episode. And I was like, man, that is exactly <clears throat> like being at work, right? I mean, that's <laughs> close. You can get to work in a homicide. I don't watch the cop shows and just like the the true crime genre. This podcast, uh, I didn't even listen to them because I didn't want to hear it. You know what I mean? And I understand. And, uh, but <clears throat> the hugely important now i'm gonna tell y'all something david rabelais is not gonna take this laying down and the the uh he's suffering i mean i'm gonna just be honest i mean he's, he's teared up numerous times since we've been in the room today et cetera. this is obviously driving him and eating him i can't imagine if it had been my case and i had to do it all these years let me tell you something he pretty much has to see courtney's recovery site where her body was found almost every day and i'm not going to go into any descriptions why but it's it's in close vicinity to him so that's another fact that that i'm sure triggers it but three weeks ago when I came over and I told him about the lie or the things that, I mean, I didn't even know they were lies at the time when I told him about it or that he didn't know. Um, and then last week when I got to tell him and then some more stuff today, uh, the, if, if I'm just tell you something, we're not done. Okay. And, and David Ravelay is a fighter. And somebody's got to somebody's got to answer for this, and I won't go into it. We we'll go, go go ahead. I just I just really believe the good Lord up above is going to put the right information in the right hands for this case to be solved. Right. I, but, I think it's. Uh, but 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 tell me this: the how pissed are you that oh. you found out all this stuff? I mean, do you? I mean, that what do you, day, what do you first think? Day you came to Texas and you told me this stuff. Even after I left you, we were together an hour, hour and a half. Right. When I left you, my heart was beating so fast. It's like, <laughs> you know, when you're a kid and your brother steals your Halloween candy, you're mad. You want to, you know. Right, right. Uh, I, was just, I was just mad. I was upset. And I thought, my God, if this information would have been available to, to me, I'm not going to say to us because they had it. Right. If it would have been available to me, I would have gladly gone to Alexandria and picked up the cigarette butts and the Dr. Pepper cans and taken it to the DPS lab myself. And then phone records. Phone and, records. And and you would have yeah. gone out and if I find out who the <clears throat> people were. We had an officer at, uh, at our department. That's all he did was trace uh, phone records. He could have traced down those numbers. I could have. Uh, he could have pinged off the towers. Said, hey, he could have pinged the towers. Uh, you know, I could have called Cedric and him and said, hey, this number belongs to this person. Wrap him up. I want to come talk to him. If Cedric had been cooperating, and um, so you, you piss, and then rightfully so, you've been you've been suffering, and I'm hurt. I'm hurt that a brother officer would do that to me. I really am. Yeah, it's it just it just I don't I can't fathom it. I can't understand it. Yeah, well, but to have another officer jerk you around like that, especially on a homicide, right? I mean, you know, I've had officers come up to me. When I'm booking a DWI in jail, I've had other officers who were putting somebody in jail come up to me and say, hey, man, that's my sister-in-law. Right, right. <clears throat> you know, okay, sure. okay, right. okay. Right, But, uh, you know, to, to, co- to just outright lie and omit evidence in a homicide case, especially, is just, well, I don't even know a word for it. It's just crazy. It's stupid. Well, and, and, and my feelings are, the only reason you would do it is because you got something to hide. There you and go. I may be totally wrong. That's my personal feelings. But, but but that's what I was saying earlier. If you, a person sits outside and looks in on this, and somebody said negligence of that, I'm thinking fuck negligence. Yeah. I mean, this is way beyond negligence. And and I'm telling you, if because I can't say that I know for sure, but it, it, I mean, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, whatever, right? But here's the deal: 
I believe we're going we're gonna to do this. I mean, yes, we're 15 years behind, but we are getting so much information. A lot of it I told you about earlier, and we, we're not ready to share that on the podcast yet. But I know one thing, and you know, if whoever the bad people are, when they go down, if they there's a law enforcement officer that was covering for them in some type of way, what the hell do you think they're going to do? The first oh, thing they're going to give him up quick. They're going to sing to to get the better deal. They're going to throw him under the bus. And, hey, let me and, tell you what he's doing, and it'd be mm-hmm, easy on me. Mm-hmm. And and so I believe I hate it, man. But you know what? We're not going to take it. You know, let you take it lying down. We're we, we're we're actually going to take some measures that have never been taken before and that I, that I know of, but you know what, what's right is right. And what's wrong is wrong. And it is, if you are so bad out there that you do this and you cause, and not only in an official capacity, you are, you, you blocking and stopping this homicide investigation, but you are damaging lives. There are people that like detective Rabelais who are absolutely destroyed by this and and still live with it hard after 15 years and now since the real life real crime the podcast we've been doing who murdered courtney coco the the <coughs> people are hurting again or, or the, the hurts come back to the top of the surface and, and detective rabelais really is getting the short end of the stick because he knows and y'all i'm telling you jim Research Ravelay's career. You heard Jim say the other day he had, his reputation is impeccable, et cetera, et cetera. But he could have done it, and and I believe that, and I, and I'm praying that we'll we'll be able to continue, and that we're going to do it. I think we may have a we. I can't promise it, but I feel better that David's on our team now. But you know what? If you're dirty, we're coming for you, and that could be if you're dirty for Courtney's murder. Or if you're dirty and having <clears throat> having something to do with stopping the murder from being solved, we're coming. You, you know, Woody. I, I, one more thing that I, I left out. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm sorry. Sorry. We even went as far. I don't know if uh, Stephanie ever told you this or not. She hired a psychic. Yes. She at one time. Yeah. And I even called the psychic and worked with her. The psychic told me that she felt like Courtney was killed in Alexandria and wrapped up in her comforter and hauled off. Did That's why the comforter was missing off the bed. And she's, uh, I'm, not, I'm trying to do this from memory from 15 years ago. But uh, she needed a, a picture of the place where she was found. I went and took pictures. I had them developed, and I, I sent them to her. Uh uh, well, I, we worked with her. I worked with her for three or four days. I mean, it really never gave me any kind of a real good lead to start, but it put some good ideas in my head. Uh, but that's how far this family has gone, just to try right. to 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 get closure. Right. And then here you have, you know, just I'm sorry, but a mosquito bite on a policeman's ass who's blocking everything. It's just it's it's ludicrous. It's just crazy. Yeah, I agree. And the family deserves closure. Courtney deserves to be respected enough for her murderer to be in jail. Absolutely. For real. Well, I'm, I'm sorry the, for ripping the wounds open, but I'm not no, sorry that, you, okay. that you're going to be with us. If it'll help, going, going I'm, I'm, I'll do anything I can do. And we're, we're, we're going we're gonna to keep fighting, y'all. And somebody's going to have to answer. And and so you hear it, heard it here today first. Detective, retired Detective Rabelais is now going to be joining Jim and I on actively working this case. Just like Jim hadn't set foot in Louisiana, he's but he's doing it every day, doing what he does. Detective Rabelais is going to be here in Texas, but you already heard him. It's all he can think about. But then, and so I'm going to feed him all of the information that we have and everything. And it's going to be a huge asset to us. And the, I think it's time that somebody's got to an answer for, for the things that were done or not done in this investigation. And we're going to take some action on that, right, David? Correct. 
All right. We'll take every action we can. And, and we're not going to elaborate on that now, but we're, we're, we're going to do that. And then you're going to, you're going to hear about it and everybody's going to hear about what's coming down. So you got anything else, brother? Some of the things coming down may really, may really shock you. That's right. Exactly right. Make you go, Oh, yep. And, wow. and that's right. And so, um, one step at a time. And I appreciate you, my brother. And, no problem. Uh, um, so y'all, thank you for listening and, uh, you know, love and appreciate each and every one of y'all. Uh, it's got to, got to keep sending in your tips, et cetera. Listen, yesterday I did a little live video on Facebook and within an hour I had three new tips and I, two of them are, are very legitimate. So when y'all like it and share it, and you keeping the pressure up, right? And then, and David, I know you, I told you that they took Courtney's case from, it's no longer on the cold case. Right. It's now a current active investigation. That is because you lifers out there putting the pressure on. Is it being investigated by the sheriff's office or by it, the it's, a, it's on the sheriff's office website as, as current number one. So the, uh, I would like to believe it's not just an election year. I think they, right. they, they're they getting their best guys on it. You know, like you said, like I know that and shit, I just can't get away. And we got it at least a little bit into the investigation last week, but I can't get away from fucking what green and them did, man. Well, and, and I'm also, not bashing it, but shit. I mean, it, 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 I just, I can't fathom it. Yeah. You can't get it through your head. It just, it just won't go through. Uh, uh, another thing is uh, that we didn't mention about two, three months ago, the sheriff's office up there sent two officers down here to Winnie. It was about it was about two years ago. The two years, yeah, that's yeah, what I'm saying. Right. Sorry, about two years ago, and they contacted me. I brought them by the place where she was found. Uh, I gave them what information I had. And they said that they were uh, assigned to this case and that they were going to really work it hard and then see if they could they could get some, you know, get it solved. Well, a few days later, uh, Detective Isles, I believe his name is, right. called me back and told me that they had rerun or that they ran uh, another toxicology off of Courtney's spleen, not just blood, off of her spleen. And they said that it came back that she was just loaded with uh, with narcotics, and that they're closing this case as overdose. And that's just not. I'm sorry. That's not believable. That's not. But uh, from the autopsy report that I have, and I have no reason to believe that my pathologist is lying or, or did it wrong. But uh, that that's just not true. That's not true. Yeah. So I don't know what they're trying to hide. I don't know who they're trying to hide it for. I don't know what's going on over there, but it needs to stop. It needs to stop, and a real investigation needs to be done by somebody who's got the gahunas to step in there and do it and not, not worry about whose toes he steps on. That's right. And and the – I don't know if I told you this, David. I mean, um, the they went so far as – to come back with the new toxicology report, they they took it to a pathologist in Alexandria and had him write up this scathing report uh, about uh, being an overdose and all this stuff. He never saw the body, never saw the body, and he doesn't know the chain of custody on uh, whatever evidence they took in to have tested, whether it was blood or spleen. Now, here's the deal. Got a lot of lifers out there that are in the medical field have given me tons of information. One of my favorites from Houston and they sent me literature on the spleen is the fastest deteriorating organ in the body. It cannot be tested 12 years later unless it's been deep frozen in that, like that crypto cryo stuff. I right. mean, but, it, but that's who I, I, Chambers County got money for that. <laughs> and, and, and all the autopsies I saw, the, the, uh, as you mentioned earlier, uh, uh, a sample of the liver, a sample of the lungs, a sample right. of the heart. A sample of the brain, everything—a small sample of every organ in the body—is taken, put in formaldehyde in a in a small plastic uh, jar with a with an airtight lid, right? And it's stored. Uh, and, and but, you know, if, if the spleen is, uh, <clears throat> if that's the fastest deteriorating organ in the in the body, I mean, good Lord, Irene, it's uh, 
Uh, yeah, and, 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 and years, it's said plenty of time, and it's a formaldehyde. But the 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 other thing is, uh, they told they told the family that it was her blood, and we have it on record of a conversation with Detective Isles. He said it was blood. He even described. Uh, he said that we called down there and they had blood. Uh, and when we got down there and got the blood and got tested, we're, we're going to get into all that because I'm a, there's got to be a chain of custody. But it, regardless, we, and I hadn't told it until today, there is an independent from, independent from Alexandria, independent from Chambers County Sheriff's Office, independent from the pathologist that did the autopsy. There is a report that states that alcohol was not the cause of death and can be proven that can be proven medically by the weight of her lungs and look they, that new toxicology said she had like over uh four or five times the legal amount that's why i was going back to earlier when i drank 18 beers in t- less than two hours and i, I only blew a point one four they're saying she was over a point four zero no and, and <clears throat> no way that was, you would have smelled. That, that you would have smelled that. Oh yeah. I mean, I, I, I know the body's decomposing. You just right. smelled that alcohol. Right. And and <clears> the, <throat> uh, anyway, well, but, let's let's hope those guys are, are are finally doing what they're supposed to do. But guess what? We're not going to stop, and we're going to keep pushing forward and um, love and appreciate each and every one of y'all. Real quick, the last night, y'all know we were nominated um, when we were only five months old. We were nominated for People's Choice Podcast of the Year Award. Also in two more categories, People's Choice Podcast of the Year Award for Society and Culture and Drama and Storytelling. And I would be remiss if I didn't, didn't say this this week because the we made the finalist. We didn't make the finalist for the, the one of the year uh, out of seven over 750,000 podcasts were eligible for. But we made the finals. The top 10 for society and culture and drama and storytelling. And I literally like to fell out of my bed in the hotel last night. My wife, I was watching it. It was on live, right? And, uh, I was watching it. And last week as, as a joke, I did acceptance speeches recorded that I had to send in. I didn't even say the name of the show, but I had to do it or, or if you, if you were a winner, um, you, they wouldn't give you the award. Uh-huh. So so I did it as a joke when I was in West Monroe last week on, on, on working on this case. And I think it says, said, and the winner is real life, real crime, the podcast. When, when my wife calls in and she's screaming, and, you know, y'all, it's, it's a huge uh, blessing. And uh, that's a very big accomplishment. Yeah. Well, and then we were only. We were only six months old at the time that the final panels voted on and everything else. But I want to thank everybody out there for doing it and uh, liking and listening to the show. Y'all, please continue to share, especially on Courtney. You see me on there every single time somebody put a post about her. I say, please share, 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 because you never know when it's going to be the right thing. Patron supporters, thank you. I absolutely cannot stay on the road for months plus at a time. I mean, uh, without some kind of support and, and y'all have given so generously. Some people have, have donated and I appreciate that too. Um, if you can't donate, just like us and share us, leave us a review on iTunes and we appreciate you. And David Ravelay, I appreciate you, my brother. And I'm, I look forward to working You're very with welcome. you. I look You're very forward welcome. to working with you. So thank y'all. And, um, till next time or ever, I'm Woody Overton, your host of Real Life, Real Crime, the podcast. Jim is not here today. Sorry, brother. Uh, but he, I assure y'all he's doing his thing. And I'm looking here at my phone since we were recording. I've got like seven messages from Jim. Uh, uh, Jim will be back with us next week. And but anyway, don't let us catch you down on murder by you. Peace. The Evidence Locker is a weekly podcast about international true crime. Made by hardcore true crime fans, it's somewhat grungy. Join us as we explore the dark corners of the globe. We've covered cases from Sweden, Brazil, Australia, and the U.S., to mention a few. Find us on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts.
you have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be against you in a court of law. You have the right to an attorney prior to and during questioning. If you can't afford one, the court will appoint one for you. You understand your rights? <laughs>